Welcome everyone. Uh, we are here to learn the glories about giving presentations, oral presentations, poster presentations. Uh, it's also particularly well timed. Why? What's happening two weeks from tomorrow? Yes, yes, the GPSA Research Forum. That's two weeks from tomorrow. Uh, so that was intentional. Why have a workshop on this topic now? Because many of you are actually preparing to give oral presentations or poster presentations at the research forum. So this is a nice opportunity to, to think through some of the steps for preparing your presentations. Uh, we have a terrific set of panelists today who will cover the breadth of uh, input for doing this well. So we're going to start off with Katie Bastian, who's a PhD student in anthropology. She's more recently been working on her dissertation, uh, writing it up, but she's taken time out of that process uh, to be here today to share her thoughts on uh, giving presentations. And it's also worth noting that she's been involved in the GPSA research forum uh, for several years. So she has a sense of what works, what doesn't work, uh, and so forth. So you might be able to you know, uh, ask some questions with, with a focus in that direction too. Uh, we have Dr. Je uh, Dr. Chung, who's been here since, what, 2004 uh, in yes. the Department of Geoscience. <laughs> Uh, you can ask him lots of questions about Great Basin geology, or you can ask him about how to give an, a good oral presentation, right? Uh, so uh, in the course of inviting him for this, this panel, you noted that you'd never given a poster presentation. <laughs> he's, he's always getting the illustrious uh, uh, podium presentations. Uh, so uh, uh, he'll be able to speak, though, to, to giving a good uh, uh, podium presentation, whether at the research forum or at a professional conference or the like. Um, then we have Dr. Uh, we have David Montgomery Blake, who's in the uh, Department of, uh, or he's an OIT, yeah. but um, is the Computer Facilities Supervisor. He knows all kinds of good stuff about uh, printing out a poster, among other things. Mm -hmm. um, who wants to spend a lot of money printing a poster? <laughs> I've spent hundred dollars at Tinko's before. Uh, you don't have to do that. Uh, there are other avenues to saving money uh, on campus. So David will be able to talk you through. Uh, how to do this well, but also do it uh, mindful of the cost. So I'll turn it over to our three panelists. Uh, they'll go in sequence, and then we're going to have plenty of time for Q&A uh, as well. Okay, well, thanks. Um, glad everyone could be here. How many of you have never presented anything in any set of type of conference before? So plenty. Okay, so that's good. That's good. This will be very helpful for you, and even if you have presented before, there are lots of tricks to making a poster, tricks to getting your head around how do I get through a presentation successfully when it's a podium presentation. And so this will be really useful, I think, for you. So thank you for coming. Um, as Dr. Gray said, we have the GPSA Research Forum in a couple of weeks. And whether you're doing a poster or a, um, a podium presentation, or if you aren't presenting at all, it's a great opportunity to see all the different ways that research can be presented. Uh, there are different visuals you can use, different uh, ways to transition slides, things like that. Ways you want to do it, you'll see ways you probably shouldn't do it. And so I think you're on the right track by being here to do it in a, a more appropriate way where you don't lose the audience and you still get your point across. Uh, much of what I'm going to talk about for my section today is going to be related to posters. Uh, people often think that posters are the easy way to go, not necessarily. You actually have to uh, prepare yourself to be able to discuss it in many different ways. You're researching different ways for the people that will come up to you. Many of them may have zero background in what you study. Many of them may have expertise in what you study. So you have to be ready to handle the challenging questions off the cuff. You have to be ready to explain it to someone in layman's terms. Uh, and you also have to be ready for the awkward moment where you're just standing there while they are looking at the poster. Um, that's something you don't think about until you actually are there and you're like, okay, this is really weird. While they're just staring at it and you're standing there as the author, they could just talk to you instead, but they want to see the poster. So they're going to read it before they ask you any questions. So it's important to make the poster appealing, but to grab someone's attention maybe for one minute. Honestly, you don't want to go so crazy where they can't get through the major uh, areas of it within 20 seconds and the whole thing within a minute. That sounds really daunting, but in reality, when you're standing in a room full of 60 posters and hundreds of people at a national conference, they're not going to spend much more time than that. 
unless it's something they're really interested in. So you want to be able to grab their attention. And honestly, the first thing that you even have to consider before you get to the poster is the abstract. And this applies to the paper itself. Because people are going to come to your poster or your paper presentation based on what your abstract is and what your title is. So you need to put key factors and key terms in those areas so that you are attracting the people that your research is most important to, the people that you really want to get your message across. Um, Becky was nice enough to print out some abstract guidelines that the GPSA has created. This is actually embedded within the registration for the forum this year, but you can access it through the website. She also has um, copies out on the table, I believe, and we can get you more if, if we run out. But um, it's, it's really important to be clear and not to use too many technical terms to get basic results communicated so that people have an idea um, of what you're trying to talk about in that presentation. The trick a lot of times for some fields is that they want to see results in the abstract and you might not have even started the project. Sometimes you're submitting these abstracts nine months in advance of the actual presentation. And so it's always better to be farther along in a project that you want to present than to barely have started. Um, some of us sometimes get caught up in that, especially when you're really excited about a new project. You think of all the things that could happen that you could be able to present in nine months, but think of all the problems you could encounter as well in that nine months. And if you have to withdraw something, that's problematic. So be aware that you need to have something solid to put into an abstract before you should submit it um, for acceptance in a, in a setting of a conference. Um, so with that, I was going to take you through um, an example of a poster that I've done. Now I'm in anthropology, I study human bones, um, and this is just one example of a poster I've put together. Something that you want to do, you can use PowerPoint typically is what most people will use to put this together. I know of people who are more versed in, uh, say, Photoshop or Illustrator, they'll use that. I am not that technical, so for me, PowerPoint is the way to go. Um, I have a list of, of different functions that I'm going to walk you through for things to keep it nice and neat. For me, I'm a little bit OCD, and I like to have everything aligned perfectly. I don't want anything looking a little crazy in one area and then very uniform in the other. I'm crazy about colors and spacing and all of that, and I'll show you how to make sure that you are consistent throughout creating this. So basically, you're always going to start with a blank slide, um, and, and the easiest place to start is with the design. So here I've used kind of a solid but gradient background. You can use these, of course, but these aren't really effective for posters. They're effective for podium presentations. So for me, what I always do is I'll go to the background styles, and then I, for example, this one is probably, I started with this, but then I went into the format area, and I chose a different color. So you see the gradient there, and you can change the effect, but it looks like I went with two different colors, and now we're back to where I was. Now one thing when you're using color like this, especially on a gradient, you have to think about how it's going to print. It's one thing to see it on a screen like this where there's lots of digits, I don't even know how to say it, maybe you the IT person would know better, um, but how you've got the digital pixels and everything makes it really look nice and clean and a great transition. When it prints, it's printing it line by line by line, and you're going to see that great gradient a little bit more clearly and rougher when it prints like this. So as nice and red as that looks here, it actually kind of turned out brown as well when I printed it. Um, this was not red, it was more brown, and so that's something you also have to think about when you set the background design. Um, something else, there are a few um, preset, if I can remember where it was, uh, there's a preset kind of different ways to do it, like there's patterns, 
um, different ways of doing it. You can use something with a texture, um, gradient fill. There are different presets. So for example, if I want to go from that red to, let's say, this one, that's kind of cool. Kind of crazy, but <laughs> you can do it. Um, you can do all sorts of things to change just the background. But that's just where you start. How you design a slide actually has to start before that in your, um, let's see, it's page set up, oh, right here. So in the corner, you have where you need to set how large this slide is going to be. So over here, I have one that I've used before, and it's a fairly standard size. Every discipline is going to be different. There are some conferences I've attended where it's twice as wide, where you've got an eight foot wide poster, and then it's um, just as long like that uh, with four feet. Usually they're about three and a half by four feet. Um, you need to know what the uh, requirements are for minimum and maximum for the conference you're attending. You also need to know if that's compatible with the printer you will print it on. Um, you have to make sure that it will fit properly within the guidelines of the paper that will feed into that plotter. And I'm sure you'll address this in a little more detail. But here's where you adjust how wide and how, um, how tall it might be. You can adjust whether it's portrait or landscape, etc. cetera. Um, and then there's a drop down for specific types of paper as well. Um, so we'll just cancel that. With me so far? All right. Um, I always think it's a good idea to kind of sketch out on a piece of paper, do a little sketch of what you want to have on your poster. You don't want it be, to be too wordy. You don't want it to be too many pictures and vice versa. We don't want the opposite. Um, you want to have a nice balance, but you also need to have a flow in which the person who comes up to your poster will have an obvious flow of how they read it. Usually they're going to start up at the top with your title, of course, and then they're going to go to the upper left corner. That's the common way to do it. But you can either go down and then to the right, or you can go just top and all the way down. It's up to you. Just don't make it so that everything is random. You have to have a nice flow to it. So for me, typically I'll use different sections like you would when writing a research paper. We're using introduction. Typically you don't want to use too much, word, too much wordage, but sometimes people will use the actual abstract in lieu of an introduction. I don't like using the abstract because they've already read that somewhere else, usually in the proceedings or something like that. Um, this poster in particular has a nice grouping of images where I've got tables, I've got charts, pictures, more pictures, um, and then text boxes. The, that's where you're going to put in all of these, um, all the wording. So let me zoom in a little bit. You're going to work on it like this in areas where you're going to focus on one little area and some tricks to making sure that things are even and properly aligned is going to come in um, under the, the view tab. So up here, right here you've got the ruler. So watch what pops up. You've got the ruler where you can match things if you move it around. Grid lines is your best friend for keeping things aligned. And then guides is a, another one. So I'm going to remove the grid lines there um, so you can see where those guides are. Now if you select something, like this is a text box that I've inserted, if I want to move it and make sure that it's even with that, that guideline pops up. And then also you can do it so that it pops up to align with the right side of that text box. So we'll just undo that and put it right back where it was. Um, what else? So those three things are really important. I would say guidelines are the most important when you're initially setting those boxes up. Um, whether it be an image or a text box. But they do kind of get annoying to look through it when you're working on the text. So for areas where I want to put uh, words and everything, I always like to use text boxes. And you'll go to insert <coughs> and then text box. And then you basically just draw it out. Um, you know, you can write whatever you like, but 
then you also have to format it so that it fills properly. Because if I don't use white text right here, it's not going to show up against that background. Black text is not going to work very well. So a lot of times I'll just come along behind it and use a color to fill it in. So you always want to have a nice contrast, but not too much so that it's a stark image to look at. Um, you want to make sure that the writing is clear and that the background is not in too similar of a tone as the, as the text. Um, you can insert tables. So like right here, this is actually a table I've inserted where you go to insert again. In the corner here, you can actually use this drop down box and it will say how big you want to make it. So it looks like it will just do that automatically and it will use a preset color palette, which you can later change. But you can also um, customize this so that you can move it or whatever. Um, you can also adjust the size of the columns, the width, all of that, just like you would in, say, Excel. Um, an alternative is that you can use, say, Excel or some kind of, um, I think in, in a, you can even use the Apple pro products, uh, like, what is it? Pages, not pages, um, numbers, numbers, pages. numbers, you can use that, um, and then save, copy it, and save it as an image, and then you can embed it in the, um, here, where you would insert it as a picture or just copy and paste it onto the PowerPoint itself. Um, so all of these are going to be useful for you. Um, the great thing is with these, it usually picks a color palette that's already within the design that you have chosen, but you can alter that. Um, I probably would not want to put this color blue in this same area of the slide. It might look better if I'm going to put it down here, though, where it's pink. I mean, I would never use this background personally, but it's fun <laughs> for an example here today. Um, so all of that is really important. Little things are going to take extra time and extra effort to make sure that they're right. But if you're OCD like me, it will take you a really long time. Um, the last thing is you want to use fonts that are big enough. So let's see what I have here. Um, this font is size 32. Um, you never want anything really lower, I think, than maybe 20. Um, like I said, with a poster, you want it to be large enough. And I think 32 um, is probably similar to what most of that text is as well. A lot of times I'll use one slide that I've used for another poster presentation. You can see I have similar um, designs between that and this. I'll use the same one and then I'll just start from scratch filling in the boxes and adjusting and then I, I don't have to start from a blank screen. I can use some of the images I already have. Um, another thing related to the text is using bullet points is very useful. Um, and this applies to slides during a podium presentation as well. You don't want to be too wordy because people are going to spend the time reading the whole sentence that you are just saying. And I won't go into the podium side of, side of it, but with a poster, they don't have all day to be sitting there reading line by line by line. You want to keep it simple and direct and to the point. Um, so that's important. Um, Something, some little tricks. Um, format here is going to be different if you are hovering, if you're working on a text box. You see the different things that you can do there. Compared to an image, it's going to change. Um, I think with the formatting, there's a lot of different ways you can go. Make sure you're saving frequently in case you mess it up. <laughs> um, it's not so bad of an idea to have version one, save it, and then start version two, and just keep working so that you can always go back to an older version. Because um, undo will only go so far. Um, you may start on one path and think, oh, this is going to be great, and then find out this is completely wrong. So having backup versions is great. Um, this, like making sure that you have the same types of font and style and everything for titles, if you just, um, Copy it, paste it, it'll put in another one, um, and then you can just drag it down. That's what I always do. 
put it where it needs to be, and then start. I type in the different uh, the different text that it needs to be, and there you have a mirror image basically with different font. Um, what was the last? It's important to constantly be going back and forth to look at your whole picture, look at the whole thing after you've been working on a tiny area for a while. You may see something from the larger perspective that you didn't before. Um, so keep going back and forth. And then finally, um, there's one trick that sometimes is is useful. I'm trying to remember where it is. But sometimes just right click will we'll work on it too. Um, where if you're overlapping images, like let's say you want to make kind of a collage like that. Um, I always endorse having a border around every single image, every single text box. It just makes things crisp and clear. Um, and that's simple as um, under the format where you have a picture border and you can select what color it is, how thick it is, if you want a really thick border on that, um, it'll change it that way. But um, bring to front and send to back is something that people don't always know about. Um, if you want to have one picture in front of it, rather than moving them all around, you've got them perfectly spaced, but this one just needs to be in the back. That's one thing that um, you can use. Um, I think the last thing that I would say is uh, it's optional as to whether or not you want to put references on a slide. I'm not a big fan of putting citations on the poster because it just is extra space that I'm filling up with words. Yeah. Funding? Funding sometimes is something you should put on there, um, but it can also be on the, uh, the references sheet that you hand out. And sometimes that's a good thing also to have because most conferences, you're not standing at the poster the entire time it's displayed. You're only there for a small uh, window of time. And so you can actually poke them onto the board. You have a folder or whatever um, listed with maybe your business card attached where people can just grab it and go. And if they have questions, they can contact you later. So that's another way to, um, to explain that. Uh, I think that's all I have. The one last thing is logos. UNLV actually does not approve of this logo format. Um, this is something that we've since corrected in our department at least where we have our own department logo that we put on posters a lot of times, but actually UNLV licensing requires that you use only UNLV logos, and um, some people don't know this. But if you go on the UNLV website and just search uh, UNLV logo, it should bring up the, the page where it has all that information, and how to use it is under licensing. So, any questions regarding poster? production, etc. Yeah. Well, I made the last one. The person that helped me used uh, Microsoft Publisher, and mm -hmm. she thought that was so much easier than PowerPoint. Have you ever used that? I or? haven't, um, but I'm sure there's always a new way to do it that you know I could learn. Yeah. So this is just a one program that's easily accessible to everyone, which is why I chose it, and because I'm most familiar with it. She may um, have just been more familiar with it. It's so possible. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of tech savvy yeah. people that are even beyond my skill set, so <laughs> I don't claim to be an expert. Uh, I guess okay. the last thing, and this really actually result, relates to printing it, um, save it as a PDF, because your images, for whatever reason, sometimes may not want to print in the way that you have put them on here. It's fine in the way you look at it and you work on it, but when you actually send the file to print, sometimes printers, there's a miscommunication. And I'll let you address any of that, but I have found that if you save it as a PDF as opposed to a PowerPoint file, A, it's much smaller in the file size, but also it's a solid one image. It's not lots of different things all compressed to one. Um, so, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, when uh, you're preparing the actual uh, presentation of your research, how long of a talk track do you normally recommend uh, for that poster presentation? For a poster, I would say 
you should have maybe a one minute variation, a three minute and a five minute. Um, I don't think most people are going to stay for the five minute. Mm -hmm. They're going to want the one to three minute and if they have questions that will um, spur additional conversation. I've seen people standing at posters talking about the, a topic for 45 minutes you know, while others come and go and don't get a chance to ask their questions. Um, but I think it's good to keep that in mind that as much attention as you might want to give one uh, viewer, if you will, of your or visitor of your poster, you got to make sure that you can keep it concise enough to address everyone's questions as much as possible. So I would say keep it short because they can read it. Otherwise, you know, if you can always, and that's the beauty of that handout too. You can hand them the handout and say, hey, here's my contact information. If you have additional questions, please contact me. We can go back and forth in a more um, detailed conversation. Or you can set up a time to meet elsewhere later after the uh, poster session has ended. Just to add one comment for, for the graduate students, I would suggest at least one program you will be familiar with. Either Illustrator, PowerPoint, or whatever you feel comfortable. You have to be very familiar with one program. If, you, if after your graduate study you have not get that, I think it's going to be problematic. Yeah. It doesn't matter which program. There are a lot of programs that are available. Like Illustrator, they can do a lot of, they can do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's even better if you have a lot of graphics. But it's more complicated yeah. than the PowerPoint. And there are particularly some some of you, if you are working in the math or physics department, you have a lot of formulas and these things. You also have your own program to do that. So every program can do this. It's a, it's unnecessary PowerPoint, but a PowerPoint is the easiest way to go. Possibly some sometimes you you're not familiar with the other programs. It's difficult for that. Although I never met a poster. <laughs> 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 But I have been the judge for a lot of posters. <laughs> <laughs> a very important thing for a poster, you have to prepare a very short version. For a talk, I can talk for 15 minutes, right? But for a poster, 15 minutes. If you are talking for 15 minutes, everybody's leaving. <laughs> so you have to prepare a one to three minutes. Caught your really important, catch your really important points in the first minute. Because your attention can only stand for like one or two minutes. If you don't, caught, don't catch their attention in the first few minutes, they laugh. And the poster is more difficult, that's why I don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I put a poster here, you have 50 people hanging around there. And, hey, what's going on? <laughs> okay, you have not responded to that question yet. And then, oh, thanks. And you feel so embarrassed because to look at you, look at uh, not interesting. <laughs>
<laughs> well, of course I import family. <laughs> so this thing is exactly like this video is talking about, and uh, you can check this. I like this video. So that body actually he captured most of the point that most of the mistakes I made in my first uh, few <laughs> I did that exactly like that. Write a lot of words in the in the PowerPoint and then start to read it. And you look back of everybody's looking at this. So I'm going to go very simple. The basic point that I, some sort of mistake I met in my previous presentations and. Um, in the previous slides, people said, you American people feel about public presentations, but that's not about American people everywhere. I guess everywhere people are scared of uh, presentations. The most important thing is the lack of confidence. The lack of confidence is related to the lack of practice or um, lack of knowledge. Okay, just like you're writing a paper, everybody's complaining, oh, I cannot write this, the writing is bad, no matter. You cannot complain your English, like I'm English, it's bad, I cannot write. No, it's because you don't understand what you're writing. Okay, so the PowerPoint the speaking, the public speaking, is also related to you don't know what you're talking about. So practice is the most important thing. Okay, so is there any solution to this problem? Not much. Prepare very well for your presentation and then practice practice until you're confident enough my presentation is over okay I don't have more to say the other stuff is just the technical things I understand the purpose of your presentation your the purpose of your presentation is to transfer your information I want people to know what I'm doing okay that's the major point so what is the way people are easily People can easily understand what I'm talking about. You think about it. Everybody has different ways of transport the information. Like, so there's no general rules. But don't think about I, I'm feeling, fulfilling a requirement. Like I have to press somebody, impress somebody like my professor. Or getting a job. Or getting a job is actually important. Finally, your final goal of this presentation is to get a job. But not every presentation is aiming for a job. Winning on words, forget about that thing, okay? If your presentation, <laughs> if you give a good presentation, you will win an award, but it's not the purpose of this. <laughs> so, before you do your preparation, you definitely need to think about it. Who is going to be the audience? Okay, if you are giving a presentation in front of uh, your committee members, or the, the conference that is focused on your discipline, you have to forget about 80% of your time spent on the introduction. But if you are giving a public talk, you know the audience have a lot of people who are not going to be focused, not going to be familiar with what you are talking about. You have to do a lot of preparation slides for the introduction so that people can get into your research. And you have to think about the styles as well. In the scientific field, you're the graduate student, you cannot use a lot of animations. Sometimes you see the jump over and flip over, this kind of thing, fancy <laughs> stuff. That kind of thing, people immediately know, this guy doesn't know what he's going to talk about. <laughs> okay, there are some sort of rules here, like the experts, you have to minimize in the introductory material, maybe one or two slides, to state the very important things of your research, and then go to the very interesting topic you're talking about. <laughs> and sometimes you have to give a talk in a meeting that you look at the abstract of, uh, of your meeting section, you immediately to know whether these people are really familiar with your topic or not. If they are all new, you have to prepare most of your slides as the introductory slides, leading them into the introduction, your research, and then in the end you spend like 20 or 30 percent of your time talking about your results and the interesting point. Most of the time, you run into the last one, mixed. There are some people who understand your topic, but most of the people 
or half of the people don't understand your topic. And this is the most difficult. You have to judge. Maybe in the middle you put like half of your slides as the introductionary slides, and in the middle you give a very give some very important points for your research, and then give a really good conclusion. Okay. The length of the presentation. This is it. I guess this is the most important mistake people would make. You always think I know a lot of things. I wanted to give everybody all the stuff I know. So you start with like five, 50 slides in 15 minutes. I'm sure you're going to fail for that. <laughs> okay, so most of the conference you are going to give a 12 to 15 minutes talk. That's, a, that's the normal schedule for the conferences. For a 15 minutes talk, you have to end at 30 minutes or so. Okay, so give two or three minutes for the audience to raise questions. If you give a talk and nobody asks you a question, it's embarrassing. <laughs> you know, it's very embarrassing. And most of the time, people did not ask questions is because you occupied the 15 minutes and then the presiders go. <laughs> <Don't stay anymore. laughs> and even if people have questions, you have to leave. So that's the problem. So, for a 15 minutes talk, Make one, two, three points, most important points. Don't get more than three. Get more than three, people get lost. That's one thing. Another rule is this. That's the most important rule here. That's my experience for 15 years, giving the presentations. Okay, one minute a slide. If you are giving a 15 minutes talk, don't get over 15 slides. Okay, very important thing. You cannot, if you talk about your slides for less than one minute, unless the very simple, wordy slides, you cannot explain very clearly. So you have to remember that thing. If you are giving a 15 minutes talk, no more than 15 slides. If you are giving a 45 minutes talk, no more than 45. That's my mistake. Mistake happened in the early days many times. Okay, I give like, 90 slides for 45 minutes. I'm sure in the end, go forward 40 minutes, you still have another 35 slides <laughs> behind. <laughs> then you get nervous. Uh, maybe I should skip this. Oh, no, 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 just go next one. Go next one. <laughs> what are you talking about? I have lost my interest because you skip all of your slides. <laughs> okay. Um, some design principles in general, you have to keep a very consistent design. Like if I have chosen this place, this kind of pattern, like this type of slide, you keep it for your entire presentation. Then the shift, the shift is the color design of each slide, uh, because this this will brand the people's eyes. Or what he is doing, like, just like changing too frequently. Graphics. We also have a tendency, always, yes, yeah, this graphics, this thing is beautiful. I'm going to put it here. And one is really like, I have done some related to that. It's also meaningful. So I stuff it into it. But when you are giving a talk, if you put a slide, you put a picture here, you cannot explain it. What you're not going to talk about, you are distracting people's attention. Because the audience is going to look at that figure, but you didn't even mention it. Most of the time in your early uh, talks, people will ask the question, what's the meaning of that slide? But you yourself didn't even prepare for that. And then that's going to be really embarrassing. And um, for the font, at least 18 points. Any slides, you should not have any words less than 18 points. If you look at this, 18 points is this small, right? If it's smaller than that, people cannot read it. And people have the curiosity, the curiosity, you know? If there's something they cannot read, they start... <laughs> they really pay attention to those stuff they cannot read. <laughs> okay, the stuff that is very obvious, no, I ignore it. <laughs> so if you get your, your points too small, they're going to read that. Generally, you leave some space, like 1.5 line space, no more than two forms per slide. And also, don't list a lot of sense in one slide. People don't have time, don't have the energy and the 
persistence to read all your uh, points there. A void like this, all off case. <laughs> you run all of the words like off case levels and distract people's eyes as well. Contrast the text from the background. You use a little bit of dark color and then the white color text or the black color white text. And also, <laughs> don't use too much color, okay? Use one or two color contrast is okay, but don't use too many like this. <laughs> the rainbow effect looks like really distracting. And also, use the medium or dark background. Um, that thing is your choice. Everybody has a preference. You can look at it and feel comfortable. If you or I feel comfortable, I guess your audience will feel comfortable as well. And a limited number of fonts, I'll give an example like this. Don't change the font style frequently, okay? Use one word to stick with it. And the scientific research, the purpose is to transfer the information. It's not for fancy stuff. And also the color effects. The PowerPoint have this kind of change the design scheme and change of this, change of this. If you click that, the color changes as well. For example, for this one, I wanted to use a sort of yellow to emphasize it, but I unfortunately checked with, I changed the scheme for this, <laughs> and that thing is completely gone. Okay, uh, this is only an example. A lot of fonts are like this. A lot, lot, of, lot of designs and a lot of colors are like that. So if you click that button, you have to check it back to see all of the fonts and the colors are right. Graphics, simple graphics. And people normally pay attention to the stuff you're talking about at the same time they can see the effects in the graphics. And this is a statistic to say audience, if they can hear and see, their attention is 50%. Even that is 50%. Okay, so if they can see it but cannot hear it, well, it's 20%. If you can, they can only hear, the attention is 10%. Okay, so be careful. That means you have to make your writing and your graphics and your speak consistent with each other. Okay, if I'm pointing to that figure and talking about this side, you need only 20 seconds to lose them, lose your attention. Okay, and also make all the text readable. Again, don't use the very tiny slides, the tiny words in the beneath a figure and I was hoping that people is going to read it. That's not going to be the case. They are not going to read it. They are going to pay attention to these little words and forget what you're talking about. <laughs> and also, uh, you know this aesthetics, statistics about the attention. When you are given a seminar, no matter it's going to be 15 minutes or 45 minutes, the very beginning, because you are new, right? You stand up and you are new. You are going to pay attention. One minute. <laughs> just look at one. <laughs> talk about it. So that's going to be the attention here. After a while, it's sort of boring. Right? <laughs> and then in the end, because it's sort of finally it's over. <laughs> <laughs> so in the middle, it's this attention. Okay, so if you lost the audience in the first uh, one or two minutes, you're gone. This talk is not going to be good. Okay, if you lost them in the first two minutes. No matter how fancy you are, your stuff is in the middle, or how important the research is, sorry, I'm not interested in it anymore. So pay attention, your beginning of the presentation is the most important. If you cannot get attract their attention in the first two minutes, you're done. Okay, so call their attention here. When they have this attention, if you really attract their attention, they are gonna stay like this. Or possibly a little up. Okay, graphics. You make this kind of ugly color and with little <laughs> small points here and <laughs> let people to read all of this kind of 90, 50 like small fonts and then their attention are all here. Look at your figure. What are you talking about? I don't care. I'm reading that. <laughs> <laughs> so be careful with that. When you are giving a presentation, in, in a PowerPoint, you got to put your phones bigger, your, si your figure simpler. Even your real figure is much more complicated. Like, the real figure is really complicated, but you have to simplify it. 
make the major point reduce that figure just for that presentation. It's not that I put the original figure. That the original figure has a little eight font, eight points, uh, fonts, and also the very little dots in the figure <coughs> and the fancy colors. When you are transforming that figure into the PowerPoint, redo it, simplify it. In the meeting, okay, that, that is the same because the first two, one or two presentations, you will be noticed. So expect that. Okay, I wanted to the GSA or the AGU meetings. I wish all of the presentations is in the first day, okay? If, if they unfortunately schedule your talk in the third day, your Intel meeting is over. <laughs> you notice it less. Look at people, oh yeah, that presentation is great, so I need to prepare a little bit, but you don't have the energy to prepare. So you struggle for three days, in the end, exhausted. <laughs> so now, if I wanted to give a talk, I always ask, can you schedule that in Monday? <laughs> 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 and another thing, of course, it's, a, uh, it's an important thing is that a talk is a show, okay? Although you are not finding a job during that talk, but you know this audience in the conferences, somebody may be your future employer. Be careful with every talk. So when you are giving a talk, if possible, you have to look at where is your conference room? What's going to be the setup? And if it's possible, you do a little practice to adjust yourself in that environment and also the voice and the, the, the settings and how big the room is. Another thing is that don't do that kind of thing, okay? It feels like sort of nervous coming to the front. Hello, everybody! <laughs> and then after that, your work is for 50 seconds or something. People start to wonder what is going to do. They hollow everybody, and then nothing happened afterwards. <laughs> and, and then the point, because we normally in the meeting they have the point of I have seen a lot of graduate students doing that, including myself. They have the point because they are nervous. Have the point, and sometimes the point is. Pointing to the audience. <laughs> that, you did not even notice it. When, when you get nervous, you did not even notice it. So, <clears throat> general point, project your voice. How are you going to do that in the next set we're going to talk about? Okay, be assertive, don't do that. I don't know, possible, likely, whatever. <laughs> Every <laughs> sentence has that thing in the front. Then people started lost confidence on you. Right? But, and you know, I'm, um, I'm possibly this is going to be that, and, but I'm not sure if this is um, <laughs> a lot of <laughs> this kind of sentence. Don't talk to the screen like this. <laughs> <laughs> I have seen that in uh, many years ago, it's going to be that. And, uh, you, know, uh, you are in big trouble. <laughs> Don't read your slides. That's why you cannot put a lot of words in the slides, okay? Because if, if you put a lot of words in a slide, you cannot avoid yourself to do that. Because people will not read it. They have, don't have the energy to read it. And then you yourself start to read it. It's annoying. <laughs> so how do you do that? There's no shortcuts for this. Or I can only tell you, no shortcuts, shortcuts for giving a good presentation. Know your material. Practice and practice and practice. So my early days is horrible because I couldn't even speak the English. Even today I still have this shape, right? <laughs> still in this shape, it's problematic. So what I did is I print out the slides like this. You print out the slides and then you write down what you wanted to say. And practice in your own room, nobody's around. Or go to your parking lot. <laughs> Why are you going to a parking lot? This is adjust your voice. Adjust your voice. Like in, in your room, you cannot adjust your voice. Okay, you, 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 you speak on. Um, today I'm going to talk about everybody's. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to talk about. <laughs> it's going to be in that way. And you go to your parking lot, nobody's there, and there's an open space. You start to 
speak out your voice. You can hear your voice start to be, you start to adjust your voice. And another thing, okay, this. If you're really giving an important talk, record your own talk, like in your room, sit in front of the computer, now the mouse, you can move it around, right? Just look like you are sitting in front of the audience and put a recorder there, record it, and you're listening. And you immediately find, oh gosh, that's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Practice one or two, one to three times, you will improve a lot in that. So, but before you give a talk, you don't need the PowerPoint, you don't need that print out stuff, you should know each slide what you are going to talk about. And that needs the off, uh, efforts. Okay, this guy says it takes three weeks to prepare a good talk. I'll, I'll put a bad picture here, it's the same. <laughs> okay, that's definitely true. Like for the first few talks, you need to prepare for two to three weeks. Okay, now maybe a little bit, uh, the professors are s sort of sloppy sometimes. You get too many things around and then I'll uh, prepare for f five hours and then give a talk. But it's not going to be a good talk. I, I can imagine, it's, this is not a, like because I'm an English, for me I need to prepare a little longer because I have the English problem. It's, it's not because of this, it's because everybody has that problem. Even for my PhD advisor, he doesn't have, he's a native English speaker, so he doesn't have that problem at all. I can imagine how long he spent on each talk. It's really polished. You have to build, your, build up your reputation from the very beginning. If you give a bad talk, I guess, in the next few weeks or few months or even few years, you start to remember that really depressed, really depressed <laughs> mode for a long time. To avoid that, you do adequate work before you give that talk. It's much more efficient than you give a bad talk and then regretful. Mm -hmm. oh, how can I give that? Such a bad talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. That's it if you have a question. <laughs> Yes. Uh, you said to record uh, and listen, but I guess one of the problems that I have is sometimes, you know, if I keep practicing, 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 when I do the presentation, it comes out as being rehearsed instead of a natural. No, uh, actually, that's that's a great question. That in the very beginning, you do have that because you try to memorize what I'm going to say. So you write down everything and start to recite it. Okay, that's not going to work. You start to recite it, it's not going to work because in front of the audience, you change your mood. Your emotion changes, the audience changes, you look at the face, and somebody maybe they are doing a grief face and then make you change your mood. <laughs> so, all of this can happen. The only thing uh, you can avoid that is you recite it in the very beginning, is fine. The first two or three rounds. But in the end, you have to get rid of it. Get out, out, get rid of all of this writing, get out of all of this kind of, uh, um, even look at the PowerPoints. I don't even look at it, I know what, what I have. The reason is that if you are giving a presentation here, like, like this kind of thing, you cannot look at that screen anymore, right? I cannot look at the screen, carefully look at the, what I'm writing there. You cannot look at that anymore. You have to make the major points. What's the major points of this slide? So it's not going to be exactly the words you're recording. It's just to measure if you recorded, just to know what exactly in that slide I'm going to talk about. The major point is not the, the real words you have written there. But that's the second step. When you're preparing this, the first step, you definitely need to write it. And the, to the point that you forgot about all of this, that means you're ready. I think you want to write it as a script. Don't write it as a paper. Write it as a, as a script of how you will speak it. Um, in my field, a lot of times, the conferences I attend, there are people who read the script. And I'm one who does a lot of times. I wish I could be that comfortable where I know exactly what I'm going to say and say it more in, in an endearing way. You do lose something of that charisma in terms of being off the cuff. Um, 
but having the script keeps you on time, it keeps you on point, um, so that might be a way to start it, but like you said, with more practice, the more you practice it, the better you're going to be at getting to that point. I've given many paper presentations at conferences, but I still always use a script. By the time I get to the end of it, usually, I'm less reading and more speaking, which means I'm on my way there, but I'm not there yet. It's a comfort level. Um, but the timing aspect is often the biggest reason you want to stick to a script. Um, one thing that you need to consider that you haven't mentioned yet is uh, the timer. There might be a light, there might be a clock that's counting down, there might be a buzzer, <laughs> there might be someone with a hook on the end of the stage ready to pull you down. They might shut off the screen in some places, they might shut off the spotlight if there is one. You have to be ready to be done at the end of that time. Sometimes they cut off the microphone. You don't want to be mid-sentence on the third to last slide and then have it just go blank. And you're like, oh. So practice. Make sure that your timing is right. Um, and that will help with your comfort level. I would just add that um, the audience, the thing that he started with in terms of knowing your audience is the number one mistake I see from graduate students who present at conferences for the first time, especially like large national conferences, where you have a huge variety of people there, but typically they're only there because they're experts in this field. You do not want to be introducing geology. What is geology? What is osteology or anthropology for me? I don't need to be told there's 206 bones in the human skeleton. Everyone in the room is far beyond the elementary school lesson of 206 bones in the skeleton. So don't overestimate your introduction. It's not just a silly thing to, for your first or one or two slides. You really want to know um, who you're speaking to. My biggest critique, if I'm watching a presentation you know, as an almost PhD holder, I, if I see a student come and tell me something that the last three presentations have just told me, I'm over it. I'm ready to walk out of the room. I don't care how brilliant their research is. If they just repeat what everyone else before them repeated, I have completely lost interest in what they are doing. They could be the best researcher in the world, but you got to know what people have already said. If your script addresses everything that those presentations have just all said, you just have to figure out a way to transition beyond it. You don't actually say it. Yes, your script says it, but you don't want to say it for the fourth time to the same audience. So you say, well, they've already covered the introductory material, so I'm going to move on and spend more time on the important points of this talk. And you go from there. Um, I guess my last thing is don't linger on any one slide for too long. He was saying 15 slides for a 15 minute presentation. I think the one exception to that is if you have slides where it's just an image. You don't want to have just an image of, let's say it's a picture of a mountain. There's not a whole lot to look at if it's just this mountain, unless you're describing little intricate details of it. You want to make sure that the people are looking at a photo or an image that you are explaining and guiding them through. You want to guide them through every image that you have on there. They need to know why it's important. So I would say those are my add-on takeaway points for that. Transition into uh, David Montgomery Blake giving us some uh, some behind the scenes right. tech and poster printing. All right, my, mine will be actually pretty simple. Um, some of it is uh, some of the common sense things that make it so you won't cheat yourself in the foot, hopefully. Um, because uh, I know when I was a graduate student, when, uh, I had so many expectations of uh, things that I had to do, pressures that were on me, and I would often forget the little things. And so I'm going to reiterate one of, the, one of the key things that you had in your presentation, which was um, sizing. So, setting up. All right, now, GPSA, um, 
one of the one of the things that is nice about uh, having this facility, like when I was in grad school, we didn't have anything like this. Um, so, you, so you guys are very lucky that you have a space like this that uh, is. Uh, it's a cooperative space. You can do research. You can do presentations. You can work uh, on group projects together. You, it's not only in your department. Um, wherever you can find a space, uh, you have some great technology here. You've got the computers. You can do research on. You've got a plotter here that was purchased this last year, and it's a photo. It's a photo quality plotter. Um, and so it is a really nice plotter. It's the same one that is in the media services downstairs too. Um, that you can that you can go and um, pay them. It costs more because they have to make money to sustain it. Uh, ours, we just want to break even. All you know, the ink and paper costs are pretty much what fuel it. We don't actually make any money off of the plotters and print. So what we do, we have one size of paper. It's 44 inch roll. So 48 inch poster, unfortunately, can't go all the way across. Um, but you. Since we only have one size, we can do it by linear foot. If you go to some of the other labs that I manage, they have uh, uh, square feet or square inches uh, that is charged by, and that way you can you can uh, have different paper sizes. But here we only have the one size, so it made sense to simplify it as much as possible. So if you know that your poster is going to be four feet. It's also easy for you to do the math when you get into Rebel Print because you're like, oh, it's going to be about forty-four dollars. That's, you know, better than sixty dollars downstairs or eighty dollars at Office Max. So, um, plus, uh, me and my staff have trained the GPSA uh, people, a number of the people, to help you get your posters out and and printed. So that way, it, you already have someone that's there and willing to help you that already helps you in all the things that you do up here. Uh, so, you know, if you already have a rapport with the different people up in here in GPSA, um, Becky and her staff, then uh, it, you'll be dealing with a lot of the same people that you already know and work with well. And many of you live here because you do a lot of your research here, so uh, it's convenient to have it here. Now, there are other ones, like Grant Hall uh, 246, which has the same plotter as this. Um, and Architecture 172, which has um, newer HP plotters, it, they're not the they're not as high in the photo quality as say this one is. But um, like for that poster, that would be perfect for that um, because it's mostly blocks of color rather than like a big background image that has uh, a lot of a lot of gradient gradation to it. So and variation. Uh, media services downstairs, like I said, um, John does a good John Dan Dan does um, a really good job. He's a dedicated resource uh, down there as well. It costs more, um, and retrograph or reprographics, which is I'm not sure where I'm at in the building. <laughs> I, I, my directions compass is doesn't exist, uh, uh, so just right across Harmon from the library here. And that's probably the most expensive, but they do this all the time. So does Dan downstairs. He, that's what he does 24-7, pretty much. He just he comes into work, he plots stuff for anyone that comes in, and Reprographics does the same thing. They do brochures and everything as well. Um, and Staples and Office Max, which are really, really expensive, because they're there to make money. So the, it's usually two to three times their cost. All right. so. This is, this is what you covered at the very beginning. This is the most important thing so that you don't have to rework your poster later. All of the work that she was talking about with getting everything lined up, all your guides, th that's where this comes into hand because if you don't size it correctly the very, very first time, you'll then have, it'll scale up to this huge poster and if you have any images, they'll scale up and be pixelated or they'll be skewed. Um, and the when you get into PowerPoint first, um, or any publishing pro uh, program, whether it be InDesign or uh, Microsoft Publisher, PowerPoint, they, it assumes a eight and a half by eleven sheet. That's its that's its default. PowerPoint actually assumes um, it's close. It scales to eight and a half by eleven, 
but it assumed 800 by 600 because that's when Office 2010 was released. That's what most projectors worldwide were, that was the resolution for them. And so if you go from something that's you know, 800 pixels wide to something that's 8,000 pixels wide, it's a degree of magnitude and st stretching and skewing and blurring and pixelating your, any images that you have. It's especially bad if you have graphs. So this is what it does. <laughs> you know, you got a puppy, because I like puppies. And but um, depending on depending on what program you're using and how it'll uh, how it'll do it, because it tries to do this on the fly for you. It tries to be your best friend. Um, it could get blurry like this, or it could get really pixelated. What's interesting is in PowerPoint when I did it, it was really pixelated. When I converted it over to Google Slides, uh, it then blurred it. So different programs will resize things differently. And that's because it was a really small image. And so when I converted it up, it got really big and undefined. Yeah, I would just say the better so, yeah. quality image you can start with, if it's a TIFF file, you don't yes. want to be starting with a JPEG and then have it all get screwed up because it's meant for the internet viewer. It's, mm -hmm. If it's supposed to be printed, it has to be a higher quality exactly. photo. And that's that's why if you do if you plan from the beginning and you set your sizing first, oops. Cool. Um, first thing you'll see is you know that's the real size of the image. It's going to scale and look really really awful when you try and print it. And if you're spending forty four dollars to print it, you don't want it to print really really awful. So then you know you're like oh no that's that's not what I want. Um, and you should be able to see this type of thing in print preview. Uh, always do print preview as well, because you don't want to spend $44 <laughs> uh, on something that looks wrong or um, it has stuff in the wrong place. Or say you had selected this image and you don't do print preview, it could just print just that image, not your poster. Uh, so you'd have this really big image of a pixelated puppy. Uh, <laughs> And so, but if you get a good quality image, like you were saying, and you scale it correctly at the beginning um, with your poster, the correct size, then you can actually have it be the images turn out the way you want when it prints. And that's that's the biggest thing. Is I, I run into this every semester. Um, I, I have a lot of plotters that I that I support, and the biggest thing, regardless of what program people use is they start with the default sizing and then they're like, okay, I need to I need to print this. And it's gotta be this huge this huge poster. And then when they print it, especially if it's a graph and it had text that was in the graph because it was an image, um, that graph gets skewed, your font gets to be this big but it's unreadable. Uh, it's <laughs> it, and then your data looks bad. If you uh, copy and paste large any sort of like a scatter plot uh, with large data sets, always make sure that when it scales up that the graph looks the way it should. Because uh, bar graphs, pie graphs are really easy math for uh, PowerPoint or InDesign or anything to do to scale them up. Um, but if you, if you have a lot of data points, Oftentimes, PowerPoint especially is bad at this. It gets confused with 5,000 data points so that you're looking at, at data clusters within large population flow. So you've got a lot of points on the screen, and then you're looking at clusters individually in there. You'll get drift as it scales. And so your data looks skewed. Your, data, your real data there that you're reporting on and doing everything else, it's the same. It's good data. If they actually put it into a graph, it would show the data correctly. Unfortunately, what it's showing is not the not the same data that you uh, that you had in there, unless you just make sure that you have it final, copy it in, look at it uh, <coughs> its full size, and make sure that your data points add up the way they're supposed to be. I, I see that a lot too, where um, where especially I've seen it with population data because it's always comp very complex data um, and things don't match up nicely. 
sometimes, you know, I, I've seen simple line graphs do it too, where the line would go off because it's scaled. They, acc they accidentally tried to scale the, the image of the graph, but they gra clicked and grabbed the wrong thing and they scaled the x axis. And so it then skewed off the side. Um, and unfortunately, that's a mistake that you guys made. So it wouldn't be honored as a refund in any of our labs or pretty much anywhere that you go. Um, <laughs> because, you know, we, if, if it's something we did, of course we'll refund it. Um, so, and then you, co you covered this, and it's just under design, page setup, and then you set the custom size for whatever your height and width is. And she walked you through that. Um, anyway, if anyone wants, this it will be up on the GPSA site uh, for that for this as long as, uh, well the video will be up on YouTube on the channel but um, it will be on the site for this plus I can give you the link to any of this this is the same information that the GPSA uh, staff has as well to help you set up your poster correctly and print it and this is kind of the kind of the uh, end of what I'm going to really talk about because um, printing has, the actual printing side of it has so many steps depending on which program it is. Um, but, you know, set the custom paper size. Always do a print preview. Always check your print preview to make sure that it's not getting cut off. The, the big thing that print preview will show you is if anything got scaled weird and it just looks wrong, if you had something selected, it doesn't look right. Or if you went off the edge of the paper, out of the dimensions, and suddenly half of your poster is getting cut off, or the very edge of your poster is getting cut off. Uh, we had this problem in architecture last semester when uh, a couple of students uh, printing these huge posters, and unfortunately, the very end of it got cut off. And it was like, right there. So you, you, you got Matt. Hillary, <laughs> and, and you know that was kind of it. Um, now, if you have a poster that has a lot of color variants, uh, for example, because you've got a lot of post, uh, you've got a lot of pictures uh, in, in in your poster, uh, or you have a background that has a lot of a lot of color, that you want to make sure is as close to true as possible. The best thing you can do is um, you can say there's a PDF, select about an inch of wherever your, high, your uh, color variation is the best. Print just that selection, that inch, to look at it, see how it prints out on the plotter. Because then you won't, you won't deal with the problem where your red ended up looking more brown, because there's a difference between the luminescence of your monitor and the pigment of the ink. And none of the, uh, well, we, we had initially set all of the computer, the, uh, the plotter computer in here up with color profile. All of them have the same color profile, but um, just because it's easier for us to do that. But that one has a color profile that matches the plotter. But people will you know, dim down the screen, and so that the, uh, your color temperature will change. And so you'll, you'll, it'll be a variation of the color you see on the screen versus what's on the plotter, unfortunately. Um, so that's, that's the best thing to do, is just print a little tiny thing. And you can also ask, um, if, you do, if you do the test print, let Becky or the staff know, and um, they'll refund that little bit of the test print for you, So you know, because you're just checking color. You're not actually printing the whole thing. That way you won't get charged $44, or, you know, $44 for your entire poster, and then you're like, color's off. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, so that's uh, that should be helpful for you there. Um, the rest of what I had here is exactly this process, but it's like 12 slides of click here, click here, click here, click here, click here, which is also what's included in the GPSA training documentation that I gave to Becky's staff. I know that I would lose you like crazy going through all of the supplemental information, which is like click here, click here, click here, click here. Yeah, um, they have this. I'll make these available to anyone that wants them. So you have every step that's here. Um, 
And when you when you mentioned uh, printing from uh, PDFs, that's that's a really really good option, especially if you do something out of like PowerPoint or Microsoft Publisher. Uh, if you do something out of Illustrator, it gets a lot more confusing because they're both Adobe products and Adobe Reader tries to, or, uh, Illustrator tries to make a PDF as friendly as Illustrator can use it or make use of it. So it includes a lot of data that doesn't need to be there and often that data can mess up your printout. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so make it a PDF or do not make it a PDF? Um, if you, it's, um, basically, it's usually safer to make it a PDF, depending on what you're what you're sending it out of. If you use Illustrator, no, for example, that's okay. I don't okay. Know. or InDesign, PowerPoint, yeah, PowerPoint <laughs> PDF, <laughs> PowerPoint PDF, yes, um, that's the that's the easiest. Thing. Does anyone have any? Have you? Have any of you printed posters or had any problems printing them in the past? Okay. Just, I have. Yeah, 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 I have. <laughs> I deal with problems every day. We're printing cancel, but we have our own department <laughs> printer, and that has been fortunate. But you got to be ready to go so that you don't abuse that privilege mm -hmm. of printing it for your department. Yes. Then that will be taken away if you're yes. overly <laughs> printing and canceling. Oh yeah, it's, it, platters are extremely expensive. We're approaching the, the end of our time, so I. I uh, I feel like for all of you who are giving your first presentations, perhaps this upcoming GPSA research forum, or uh, your fifth one at a national conference, I think there was tremendous value in today's presentations. You can see a lot of these things are strategic. There are tips for doing both well, whether a poster or a podium <coughs> presentation, there are tips for doing both well. And I want to thank our panelists for sharing all their wisdom. Um, I'm going to be one of the judges at the GPSA Research Forum, so I'm expecting the highest level of, <laughs> of quality uh, for ye shall be judged by folks like me using these kinds of rubrics. Okay, so thank you again and enjoy the rest of your Friday. Thanks.